Quantum computing and quantum cryptography are described mathematically using vectors and complex numbers. In the following, I'd like to give you a basic introduction to what they are. Originally, vectors were defined as arrows in space. Here I'm going to illustrate such arrow vectors in a two-dimensional plane. For example, u is an arrow vector whose initial point is the origin. Such a vector is called position vector. Then, what we know from high school math is as follows. Firstly, due to the Pythagorean theorem, the length of u is the square root of the sum of the absolute squares of a and b. Note that a and b could be negative, but a triangle cannot have sides of negative length, hence the absolute value. Secondly, if h and v denote the horizontal and vertical unit vectors, respectively, then u can be written as a linear combination of h and v, that is, u equals a times h plus b times v. The coefficients a and b are unique, meaning that different coefficients result in different vectors. Thirdly, since any position vector in the plane can be written this way, the set containing h and v is called a basis for the position vectors. Actually, it's an orthonormal basis because both h and v have unit length and they are orthogonal to each other. A limitation of arrow vectors is that humans can't really imagine them beyond three dimensions. We can represent position vectors also by their endpoint coordinates. With this notation, u is written as a, b, h as 1, 0, and v as 0, 1, but under the hood, they still mean arrows in space. However, the cool thing is that now we can generalize to any number of dimensions in a straightforward manner. Here you can see a vector w that is 100 dimensional. The trick is that we don't try to imagine 100 dimensions, but instead we generalize the formulas we have for up to 3 dimensions. For example, the formula for length now contains 100 variables, and we bravely assume that a 100 dimensional creature would calculate the length exactly this way. But the story of vectors doesn't end here. Mathematicians also realized that vectors can be studied on an even more abstract level by defining so-called vector spaces. Here you can see an example of a two-dimensional vector space. The basis vectors are called foo and bar, indicating that for mathematicians it's not important what they really mean. What's important is that there is a rule that every vector in the vector space can be written as a unique linear combination of foo and bar, like u1 and u2. And as before, different coefficients result in different vectors. There is also a rule for adding two vectors, and one for multiplying a vector by a number. With these, mathematicians are set to study vectors in a flexible way, without being restricted by any fixed meaning. It is then the job of experts in other areas of study to attach domain-specific meaning to the vectors, whenever they realize that something in their area follows a pattern that resembles a vector space. And as you might have already guessed, this is exactly what happened in quantum physics. As preparation for our next topic, the complex numbers, read this quote from John von Neumann and try to always remember it whenever you feel that you don't understand something. You don't have to understand it, just try to get used to it. I believe real numbers are called real because historically they emerged as the properties of certain entities that we saw in the world around us. For example, pieces of apples, cutting a kiwi into half, seeing a right triangular object, walking forwards or backwards, having financial gains or losses, all give rise to quantities and magnitudes that we call real numbers. Then, centuries ago, mathematicians introduced a number i, which has the weird property that its square is minus 1, and thus it cannot be a real number. This new number, i, is rightly called imaginary unit, because unlike real numbers, it emerged as a result of pure imagination. I don't say it couldn't have happened differently, and I will get back to this point later in the appendix, but historically, pure imagination was how it really happened. It all started with a few 16th century Italian mathematicians, most notably Gerolamo Cardano, who had the crazy idea of taking the square root of negative numbers. This led then to the concept of imaginary numbers, which are of the form b times i, where b is a real number. Intuitively, taking the square of such an imaginary number must result in a negative number if b is not zero.
and the connection between imaginary numbers and real numbers is that 0 times i is defined to be 0. Then, complex numbers arise when we imagine that real numbers and imaginary numbers can be added together. That is, complex numbers are of the form a plus b times i. Since b can be 0, complex numbers include the real numbers. Similarly, since a can also be 0, imaginary numbers are included too. As you can see, the arithmetic operations addition and multiplication are defined rather intuitively. On the other hand, the formula for division, which can be derived as the inverse of multiplication, is a bit more complicated. Nevertheless, from the addition and multiplication formulas, it follows that regarding the four basic arithmetic operations, we can calculate with complex and imaginary numbers just as if they were real numbers. The only thing we need to keep in mind is that i times i is minus 1, which is why we have minus b times d in the multiplication formula. Complex numbers have a very intuitive geometric interpretation. They can be thought of as points in the two-dimensional plane. The horizontal coordinate of the point represents the real part, the vertical coordinate the imaginary part. For example, the complex number z, which equals a plus b times i, is represented by a point at coordinates a, b in the plane. As shown in the picture, we can also draw an arrow vector from the origin to point z. The length of this vector is called the absolute value of z. It can be calculated by the Pythagorean theorem. The addition of two complex numbers in the plane is done by simply adding their two arrow vectors geometrically. The geometric interpretation also gives us the insight that a complex number can be written in terms of its vector length r and angle phi. From trigonometry, we know that a equals r times cosine phi and b equals r times sine phi. z can be written according to these identities, and the resulting equation is the so-called polar form. To close this section, let me show you one of the most remarkable formulas in mathematics. It's called Euler's formula, and it's used all over in quantum theory. It specifies how to raise e, the base of the natural logarithm, to imaginary powers. Essentially, it is just a definition, so don't overthink it. Practically speaking, the left-hand side is nothing more than a shorthand for the right. Using Euler's formula, the polar form of a complex number can be written more concisely. r times e to the power of i times phi. We call this the exponential form. As it turns out, multiplying two complex numbers that are given in exponential form is astonishingly simple. You only have to multiply the two vector lengths r1 and r2 and add up the two angles phi1 and phi2, that's all. And again, we would have calculated the very same result if somebody had told us that i was just a real number. This indicates that complex numbers behave similarly to real numbers not only regarding the four basic arithmetic operations, but exponentiation as well. In summary, I want you to remember two things. One is that vectors mean whatever meaning we give to them, and the other is that we can calculate with complex numbers just as if they were real numbers, keeping in mind that i times i equals minus 1. In 1831, Carl Friedrich Gauss suggested calling i lateral unit rather than imaginary unit to avoid the mystery and confusion surrounding complex numbers. Because if we say that distances in the backward direction are qualitatively different from those in the forward direction, then we can say similarly about the sideways direction too. So let's call those numbers lateral numbers with a corresponding lateral unit. The point is that if we view complex numbers this way, there is nothing imaginary there.